We are so happy today that everyone's here. And uh, we have such a phenomenal speaker that Maddie will introduce to you, but we just love her name, Dahlia Dupree. And uh, she will be telling us some great stuff. So uh, on putting your novel together and some steps to do that are easy to share. We thank everybody for being here. We thank, um, of course, um, our board member, Maddie, and uh, who finds all these speakers, who goes around and slaves over uh, conferences and everything to find where people are at, that people are happening right now, you know? And she does that. And Diana puts this all together logistically and production. We have our membership chairman, Karen, where are you? Wave your hand so people could see you. We have our newsletter uh, editor, Pam, over there. And Sharon is hidden. But and Debbie, we have Debbie, host of Debbie's Room. Yeah, I was going to get to her. And uh, De Debbie, uh, host of Debbie's Room, which has the uh, wonderful, uh, after the meeting on Wednesday, after the uh, show with uh, an author, you'll get into her room and meet intimately the author and others. So it's a lot of fun. And we're all here today to enjoy because we love writing. Uh, all of many have published here. I remember when we first joined, when all of us, well, the, uh, probably the earliest one here in the group maybe, but I remember there was only one or two of us, two people published. And now we have dozens of dozens of people published. Our books are everywhere. And uh, SCWA is you know, pretty noted just because we like to, we love reading and we love writing and we love selling books. But um, I would like to get to our main order of the day and I will introduce Maddie Margarita, our Vice President of Programming and General Manager and uh, tell us all about what's gonna happen. All right, thank you, Larry. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, uh, we'd just like to start out, if everybody wants to open their chat rooms, if you have comments or questions as we go through, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will get them to Dahlia, um, our speaker, who we're really happy, very happy to have with us um, today. Um, uh, Diana Pardee uh, first saw Dahlia's presentation in the Women in Publishing uh, uh, Conference and brought her to us. So we're so happy to have you. And anybody whose name is Dahlia Dupree, um, I just want to meet immediately. Uh, so yes, so thank you. Um, a little bit about Dahlia. Um, Dahlia received her degree in English literature from UCLA and a master's degree in social work from the University of Southern California. Years of experience as a licensed psychotherapist. Well, you're in the right group, Dahlia. We, we need more psychotherapists. Um, contribute to her ability to create multicultural, emotion-driven novels with complex plots and relatable characters. In her spare time, Dahlia enjoys bike riding on California beaches with her husband and hiking with her daughter. A contributing writer for Frolic Media, Dahlia is the author of A Whirl with My Mocha Chocolate, Chocolate Swirl. I practiced that. I can't believe I screwed that up. Let me try this again. A Whirl with My Mocha Chocolate Swirl and Orange Blossoms Love Blossoms. Welcome, Dahlia. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I am really very happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'll just tell you a little bit um, more about myself before I start the slideshow. And one of the things is I love being in the company of writers because this is my tribe, this is my group. So people who are in love with words, who love reading, who love writing, even though it can be torturous at times. And I'll just say, probably like many of you, or not, but probably like many of you, uh, I really um, started writing very early. I mean, in elementary school, I was submitting, we had a teacher who had to submit stories to the Oakland Tribu Tribune up in the Bay Area, and I would have short stories and poetry published, and all, I had a column in high school, and then at UCLA, I was an editor of a special interest paper, so my interest in writing I, I sometimes would think of it as a curse to tell you the truth, because I just, it wouldn't let me go. It wouldn't release me. No matter what other job I had, I always felt like I wasn't living up to what I should be doing if I wasn't pursuing writing. So a few years ago, I started doing it more purposefully, more intentionally. And uh, there are so many more resources now for writers than there used to be when I first was interested, uh, like, 20, more than 20 years ago. But in terms of conferences, YouTube videos, podcasts, I mean, you can really 
talk to other writers, learn more about the craft. And so um, I, I just, perseverance really, I think, pays off. And I'm going to share with you this morning, uh, and I'm about to go into sharing my screen, some of what I've learned on my journey. I realize that you are each in different places in terms of your writing careers. And, um, and so some of you have, probably many of you have already published. Some of you are on the way to publishing, just starting that journey. And, um, but I'm finding that I think no matter where we are on our path, that we always can use refreshers. And we, I know it took me a while to understand some of the terms that I was hearing um, as I was attending conferences. And I, oops, sorry, um, I realized that I needed to really um, do some studying of the craft to know that everything, writers don't just necessarily sit down and randomly write whatever we feel like writing. There's some structures, there's expectations that readers have and to make it an enriching experience and, um, and to really get to um, a, a better level of quality of storytelling. Okay, so um, Dahlia Cree, um, and thank you, Diana, so much for contacting me after um, looking at my presentation and the Women in Publishing Conference. So thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. And I appreciate being invited here by the Southern California Writers Association. Um, I am, uh, I was telling Larry earlier that I am familiar with your organization and have seen the name. So I'm honored to be present amongst you. And thank you, Maddie, for being patient with me as I got um, my materials to you. So thank you very much. Uh, although I write contemporary emotion-driven romance stories, um, which I like to say have hard um, there are some basic rules of writing that I think are really applicable across the board. Even though my uh, specific talk this morning is how to write a publishable novel in 10 easy steps. And I almost say that a little bit tongue in cheek because I think on some level we know there's nothing easy really about writing. There's the part that's easy and there's the part that's more challenging. So, um, or another title, everything you wanted to know about writing a novel, but were afraid to ask. So I know one of the things, and so some of you I understand are in screenwriting, um, just where I just shared about someone who's in um, television or film, and uh, I, a lot of this applies, it, it applies to storytelling. It applies to when we're sharing about our uh, characters. And so regardless of what we write, these rules apply. And I think even in nonfiction, to some extent, they also apply in terms of engaging, connecting with readers, our potential readers, and adding an element that makes them care to want to continue to read the words that we've written. Dahlia, before you move on, could you, I'm not sure whether it's the um, technical part of this, could you speak up just a little? Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. I will, I'm, I'll get closer to my, maybe to the laptop mic help. Okay. So I think one of the important first steps is that we really have to know ourselves and even though we're always growing and evolving uh, in terms of as writers and hopefully as people, um, just as our characters do, um, we, I think it's really important to understand what types of, well, the type of writer that we want to be and what will help us to get there. So some of what I'm referring to more specifically is, are you the type of person that likes to plan ahead where you really need to know the path? You need to know the journey. You wouldn't say, hey, let's just get in the car and drive and see where it takes us. 
And uh, so are you that type of person that's just very spontaneous? Or do you need to know where you're going in advance? Remember, uh, what's it called? What was it called? Not map quest, but anyway, you'd look up, you could put your directions in. Now it's on the phone now. You don't have to, you have Google Maps. But, um, but you know, you could map out your exact journey, where you wanted to stop, where you could get a bite to eat. Or do you prefer being surprised? Um, or do you kind of like to go with the flow? So some of these questions tie into our writing style and what will work for us because there's no need to go against what makes us feel um, comfortable. So if, and, and so that ties into the type of writers that we are. So I, you know, I see Maddie smiling at this. So I, I remember initially when I heard the terms plotter, cancer, or planter, and I'm like, what the heck are these people talking about? I'm pretty sure that cancer isn't a real word, nor is planter. And, <laughs> and I thought, hmm, I see they've made up their own little, um, you know, sort of lexicon here. So. Uh, and I know that, so a plotter, which some of you may be familiar with that, but those are the people that really like to plot. And, and knowing your style is very important. So um, then plotter needs to know what will happen in advance. They need to know, so some people write very intricate, they, they go through very intricate plotting. So that may include needing to know the character's height, their weight, their eye color. Some people even select the music that their characters would be listening to. Uh, there may be timelines. So I will say that I, this is very intricate, this, this example that you see here. I would never do anything like that. I would be impressed if someone did um, however, I am finding that I am becoming, it, I'm becoming a little more uh, plotting oriented the more I write. I, I'm finding it's helping me sleep better. Otherwise, I'm in the middle of the night saying, oh my God, I'm, I'm looking at scenes because uh, actually that tends to be how um, I create is partly, it's like watching a movie. And if I maybe wrote down that scene in the daytime, I would not have to wake up in the middle of the night thinking, no, she should be this next. Um, so I'm moving in that direction, although it's not intricate, um, such as this right here. Uh, now, a pantser is a person who likes to go with the flow more. Can you hear me okay now? Because, all right. So um, I heard one writer on her podcast refer to it as dreamscaping, and which is when we are, we're awake, and, but we are actually kind of caught up in our character's world or in our story world. We are, so I, I somewhat described that when I said I'm sort of, I'm, I'm in bed, I'm visualizing the whole scene and I'm uh, creating that. Unfortunately for me, what tends to happen is that I keep thinking of it over and over at night as if I'm going to lose it if I don't keep repeating it. Of course, I could just write it on the notepad that's near the bed. Um, that would be one option. Um, but a person who totally focuses on dreamscaping is more, um, maybe they feel that it has to be, what they write must be a totally intuitive process. And they like to be surprised. They allow the characters and the plots to reveal themselves. I've heard uh, some best-selling uh, authors say, oh, I would never uh, plot. I, like to, I don't know what my characters are gonna do. I, how could I plot? Um, they tell me, and that's what they, and people who, those are called pantsers, people who go by the seat of their pants. And I have heard them say, it would take all the joy and pleasure out of writing if they knew what was going to be happening 
uh, in the future of their characters, which is also fascinating, uh, a fascinating approach to that. And I think as far as writing nonfiction, you could apply to some degree this same style. So whether people get all their facts together and they know exactly what they're going to be writing about, or if beforehand they like to see where their mind leads them, where their creativity leads them. So this person who goes by the seat of their pants is called a pantser. Okay, so then we have the planter, and it is, planter is also known by another name, uh, not just planter, but that's sort of a combination of the two. So the person is able to plan. So I, I find myself more in this category. So I do, I, since I am writing a series right now, I, uh, it can get really confusing who's related to whom. And it can also be confusing, like how old did I say they were in book one? So is this two years later? Also, um, this is something like with no planning, I find beta readers, our critique partners, our editors can pick up. So as a matter of fact, my editor said to me, now, wait a minute for this, for book two that's not published yet, she said, are they on a plane to South Africa? Because if they are, that went by way, it's just way too quickly. That's a long flight and she's right. So some planning I find is really helpful because it will come back to me later in editing um, that that lack of planning sort of, it's gonna make me take more time later if I don't do some at the front end, but I love to see where it's gonna go also. And I still have some surprises. So. Um, both a plotter and a planter uh, may use some tools. So a lot of people swear by Scribner and they really, which is a, an app, an application uh, that has a lot of different, um, a lot of different sort of, I don't know what to call it, but like the, um, sub tools that you can use to organize your writing and you could have a paragraph that you set aside and and it's uh all done on your laptop or desktop uh i did download scribner once and i found it overwhelming to try to figure out how to use it and i thought if i could get over the stress of figuring it out it's probably really great so uh however i couldn't and so I said, that's all right. I like my index cards. They're just fine. <laughs> and so I will write out scenes on index cards. I will, I've asked a couple of writers um, recently, like, how do you get out so many books? Some people are so productive and I'm not sure how they do that. And um, the woman who's the editor at my publishing company has at least I think 22 novels that she's published. And I asked her, so in addition to being an editor at the, for the publishing company and all the other things she does, she uh, gets out all these novels. And I said, how do you do that? And she said um, that she's able to do it because that she says it all out loud. She just, she um, records the whole story initially and then she, that helps her to move through it. So I tried doing that. And I, I recorded it while I was out on the walk, sort of the outline. And then when I came back home, I, um, I downloaded it. So I feel very good that I'm, I sound like I know what I'm doing. But anyway, so I downloaded it. And, um, and actually it does help me because I feel like, oh, I outlined the whole story in a morning. Of course, I'm digressing from there, but from the, the outline. But so, but it can be helpful. So a planter does, some of both. So they change it. They're able to adapt as the story evolves. They have some flexibility, um, but there are different ways to go about that. So I just mentioned another one. Um, so in terms of sort of moving on from knowing yourself and how writing works best for you, which um, I'll, I'll throw into that. Know if you're also a morning person or a night person, when do your creative juices flow the most? I am brain dead pretty much, well, I don't wanna say how early in the afternoon, but uh, 
I really, I love the morning. I love it. I love to get up before anyone else is up. Um, I love the quiet and um, everything is better for me in the morning, which is kind of a challenge because exercise would also be a good time in the morning. But writing, I know if I don't do it in the morning, it may not get done, sadly. And, um, but, uh, but know yourself in terms of not just your writing style, but when are you most productive? Not when you would like to be most productive, but when you truly are. So don't go against who you are. Don't have that resistance that's making it more difficult. It's really important also to identify your audience. So science fiction, fantasy, romance, murder mystery, um, if you write for television and they, you have that structure, that format, um, you know, those are very different audiences. And it's not that they don't have overlap because they do, but for example, if you're a science fiction writer, I believe you have a longer word length in terms of novels that is permissible because you're gonna do so much world building. Um, so fantasy, sci-fi is probably more I am writing in the romance genre. It, the expectation is that the novel would be 50 to 75,000 words with 75, and it could go up to 80, or uh, possibly 90,000. That would be probably pushing it a little bit, but, um, but that is the expectation. It is, it's really important to know that. If you do not know your genre expectations, you may be getting rejections and you don't know why. Um, I went to a writer's conference in Orange County, as a matter of fact. Um, it was the Orange County Romance Writers, part of the Romance Writers of America. And um, I had a manuscript with me. I had not been published yet. And I had a manuscript with me, which was approximately, it was about 52, 53,000 words, met with some um, major publishing companies. Everyone wanted to see a full manuscript, but they also uh, requested that I length that I add more to it, but I lengthened it, I think by about 20,000 words. So they, even though 50,000 was okay, it was not really desirable. I went home and thought, I can't add anymore. There's no way. This is it. This is my story. 50,000 is it. Well, actually, once I got over myself a little bit, which I must say took me about a month of um, not getting any um, anything accepted back, I, I said to one, uh, a woman at the Wild Rose Press, the, the editor I had sent my manuscript to, my 50,000 word manuscript, by the way, I asked her to please not, um, like if she hadn't read it yet, could she please not read it? Because I was working on adding more words. <laughs> and what that did, and she said fine, that she hadn't gotten to it. And I found that when I added more, not only was I doing that because those are the expectations of the genre that I'm writing in, I added more depth. So I think sometimes it's, it's hard to realize that what we think is a finished manuscript is actually a draft. And I can't say how many times I thought I had finished my manuscript. I mean, really, I probably thought I had finished it five times before it was actually closer to being finished. It's never really finished until it's published, I think, because you to go through galleys and other things, but but I um, I had to get over thinking that this is it. I can't do any more. Actually, when I did more, the characters were much more complex. The story was much richer, and uh, so know what is expected of your particular genre. Know what they want from you, even with. Um, frolic media that I write for, uh, just articles, freelance, art, um, book reviews, really. And um, even understanding the voice of their online uh, site, the, the, the tone and the length and how they, the kind of opening they want and how they want the, the uh, they don't even call it an opening, but anyway, how they want it to close too. So do some studying of your genre because otherwise you may be confused why you're not getting ahead and why you're getting rejections are people saying this is good but it's missing something so romance has to have an h e a or an h f n so those are a happily ever after ending or a happily for now so if you don't know that um 
And I remember submitting something before I really understood that. And someone said, what, ha what happened in the sending? Now, if I was writing fiction, that would not be a requirement. Just uh, straight fiction, women's fiction, popular fiction. But if I'm trying to get into romance, then I need to be clear about that. Someone said, if you're right, and I don't know if you agree or would disagree with this. Um, on a writer's program, I heard someone said, if you say that your writing is for everyone, it's probably for no one. So they're saying, think of your audience. You're, you're not just, you think of people actually who would like what you write because it's a specific group. Um, so we can talk about the hook, right? So the hook is, and it took me, you know, it's, it's kind of sad to say, it took me a while to really get into what people were saying with the hook. And so this is a part where a lot of us struggle because then once I understood that the hook is that the opening, it could be, so people define the hook differently. Some people define the hook as the opening first three pages. Someone could say it's the opening first page. Others could say it's the opening paragraph. Um, I heard some writers on a YouTube discussion where they said this one editor said, hers is the first eight sentences. I mean, a hook, and we see it on television writing all the time. You know, they don't even wanna break for a commercial. They need to hook you in before you get up to go get a snack or go to the bathroom. And it's something shocking. It's something that really has to pull you in something. Uh, so for example, the opening sentence or paragraph, you, to introduce the characters, to establish the conflict right away. A reader is not gonna have, so think about reading it. So it's different from a visual um, art or performance because we're asking people to read. <laughs> and uh, so that means they have to be able to see it in their minds and, they, and it has to really engage them and hold them. They have so many options and so many choices and so many things that for some people, it would be easier for them to do. Um, but so they need to meet that character right away. It needs to establish that there is conflict and there are some big stake goals. It's not, oh, I wonder if I should wear like uh, my blue dress or my purple dress. No, that is really not interesting, right? Nobody wants to read about a perfect, happy-go-lucky family. Some of the feedback that I got on um, an earlier version of the book that eventually got published was, um, you know, that guy seems so nice, the hero. He seems so nice. Really? Is anybody that nice? And so, and the one character everybody liked was the most evil character. So, um, but you want big state goals. You wanna pull that reader in and you wanna know that something's at stake. So, and let them hear your voice and who you are as a writer. They shouldn't feel neutral about what they're reading. They should really, so even if you look at this picture, it's like, oh my God, is she running from someone? Is she frightened? Does she even have any clothes on? What is going on in that picture? And really we have to create that picture too. So at the very beginning of the story. So as, and we haven't we done that ourselves where we pick up a book, we thought it might be good. We've looked at the back cover, it sounds pretty good. Looked at that blurb on, on the, in the inside, but then when we actually read it, it can fall flat. The, the first paragraph is like, oh, I really don't know if I'm gonna like this or not. And uh, so, I mean, I know I just worked on, um, I cannot believe how many times I rechanged the first, um, actually the whole first chapter of, um, my, of my book, Orange Blossoms Love Blooms. I changed it so many times. And that's the chapter that I was very uh, anxious about, um, even the first couple of paragraphs, because I knew it was so much was at stake. Uh, so just, to be aware of that, that I, I read something uh, for a, a judge in a novel writing contest. And there was one, I felt like I was in school. I didn't get any story out of it. I just felt like she was just sharing knowledge and it totally was not interesting to me because I didn't get a gist of the story. We, we have to hook the readers in. 
And by the way, when um, going back to when I lengthened the story, it ended up being about 70 from 50,000, 53,000 words to 78,000, oddly enough. Uh, and then when I submit, resubmitted it to the editor that I asked not to read it, she said, I love this. This is really great writing. I'm going to try to get a contract for you. So if I hadn't had paid, a, well, if, if I didn't move through my own initial resistance, which I always have, by the way, initially, but I've learned I'm better now. Um, when someone says you should, you know, think about doing it this way, add more, I'm usually like, no, can't do that. What are they talking about? But after I get over that, um, I find it's usually good feedback. I mean, it's always our option, but hey, I think if I had not listened to her, I would not be traditionally published actually. Um, so show, don't tell. I remembered hearing this a lot. And um, I think it took me a while to grasp that also. And uh, active voice versus passive voice. I initially probably was more prone to writing in a passive voice, which probably is not very interesting and flat. And, uh, and I really had to, and even now I have to go over and remind myself as I'm writing um, to make sure that I am using an active voice. So an example that I will give is writing uh, the sentence, I felt sad when I saw him holding hands with Shannon versus showing the reader what you want them to see. So the example would be, my, uh, my eyes were riveted to David's arm around Shannon's shoulders, pulling myself up straight and taking a deep breath, I used to think how I used to wrap those strong arms around me. My lips tremble as a sense of loss overwhelms me, leaving me feeling foolish and alone. I was a fool for letting him go. So one of the things you'll also hear is use, uh, think of all five senses, utilize them. We wanna elicit emotion, digging deeper, um, so that we are getting, so that the reader is getting a picture of what the characters are experiencing to make it more three-dimensional and to bring the story alive. Okay, so character agency. And um, as a matter of fact, there's been a lot about character, well, about agency in the news lately regarding Britney Spears and that Britney Spears has no agency. That's what they're saying. She can't choose her own attorney. She get, can't decide how to spend her own money. So, and they actually use the word agency. So character agency is that the character, your main character has to go through a transformative process and part of a transformative process. And this is really true in real life too. We have to save ourselves. Um, my husband and I just saw, I think it was Marvel's Black Widow, um, the movie last night. Anyway, she's going to have to save herself. She'll go through hell, the main character will, to get there. But basically, nobody else can save her. She's going to have to fight the villain. She's, she's going to have to save herself. I won't give any uh, plot spoilers. But it's the same thing that happens in a novel. For the character, at some point, the, the knight in shining armor is not the one that has to save her. She, she has to save herself. Um, and at some point, the, the main character who may be a victim or a product of victim, you know, of some horrendous things that have happened um, throughout the story, or some not, maybe not horrendous, maybe some not so good, not so great, maybe just, uh, we're, we're all, you know, the truth is we're, um, I think stories, we're all emotion junkies. We all want emotion. We want to laugh. We want to cry. We want to be worried. There's some craft books written on that, um, the emotional aspect of storytelling. And if you miss the emotional aspect, you're, you're missing the whole boat, right? Because you, you've got to engage the reader in feeling something about the characters that they're, um, that they're reading about. So they may be a victim in the beginning of circumstances that are beyond their control, um, which is what happens in real life too. So at some point they have to take charge of their own lives. 
they have they they cannot be uh, even superheroes. If you like Marvel and superhero films, they have to be flawed. We don't want characters who are one dimensional because those the, no one is one dimensional in real life. They are complex. You may love someone one minute and then you're really mad at them the next. If someone says about a character, why did she do that? I don't understand. Oh, that character is so arrogant. That's a good thing. That means they're engaged. <laughs> that means the reader is engaged and they're involved. Uh, but they are, the characters are flawed. They make decisions, they make choices, and they make poor choices sometimes. Um, but as I said before, there, this woman looks like she actually um, has character agency. No, but she has a look of determination in her eyes, like, don't mess with me. Um, but, and she has to go through a transformation at some point, not because she or he is pushed, but because they want something better or more. So this is really the same as real life, right? At some point we have to decide, you know, I have a background as a therapist. So at some point, somebody could have a really crummy childhood, but at some point they have to decide, you know what, I'm gonna claim my life now. They may have said this about me, but they may have said, you could never be a writer. Are you kidding me? And, but if you want to be a writer at some point, you actually had to make a decision. I'm going to sit down and write. I don't care what anyone says. And, you know, being a writer, the thing about it is for most of us, you're sitting by yourself somewhere you, and you're writing something that you don't know if anyone will ever see it. You're putting hours in, you're sacrificing time you would be spending with other people or other things that you could be doing. Uh, but there's something inside of you that says you're going to do it anyway. So the same thing has to happen with the characters, character agency. Uh, they, they have to learn a lesson and move forward. Okay. I have no idea how my time's going, so I may try to speed up it. Okay. So conflict and tension. So it says it's a problem if there is not a problem. There, there must be conflict. There must be, conf somebody said, watch uh, at the Writer's Digest conference that they had, the first one they had in uh, LA, um, I'm thinking the Bonaventure Hotel a few years back. Um, they recommended watching, I think it was The Princess Bride, but anyway, the guy keeps trying to, to get the, to, to save the women, and, but there's so many failed attempts that it's comical. So it's an exaggeration, but it's really what our stories have to have conflict. And um, so there, there has to be a goal that the character wants, uh, failed attempts. There have to be obstacles. Um, they can be actually physical obstacles. My husband was telling me about some murder mob movie, his favorite type shows to watch. Um, but anyway, where it's really like there's a hitman that's an obstacle, you know, they're after him. I mean, it's just obstacle people having to climb down from buildings, leap from a, an inferno, uh, a, a burning building. So anyway, but there's there's a journey. We want to hear about people's journeys. It's why we listen to human interest stories on the news because we're like, oh, wow, look what happened to them. Oh, and they overcame their, you know, whatever they experienced. Um, they try to end the news on those after all the other bleak things to help us feel that there's some hope in the middle of this pandemic and the craziness we've all been enduring. So character and story arc. So, and, and those of you that have been doing this for a while, you're, you're familiar with these terms. If you're newer to writing, some of these you may have heard of or you're just becoming familiar with, um, but they're good reminders. So both the hero and the protagonist must experience transformation during the story. In romance novels, for example, often the writer writes from the point of view of the male and the female lead. The male lead, or I say lead, the male hero must also have a transformation that he goes through. And he must also have something that he must learn. And there have, so it's not just the female heroine, it has to be both parts. So there's, it cannot be an easy journey. Um, there are expectations. There are beats, are major events. I, I, beats, people using the term beats confused me for the longest time. It's like story beats, okay. And uh, our major events that happen at certain points in the story. And, uh, and there are false starts and there are successes. 
and then there are um, a lot of misunderstandings. I, as an English lit major, I uh, studied a lot of Shakespeare and I think I really understand him better than ever now that I've, uh, the way he wrote anyway and his stories and all the confusion in every single story. Because stories are about confusion. <laughs> they're about conflict. They're about errors, rather it's of identity. I mean, if you think of Romeo and Juliet, you know, they're, they're whole, they're from two different groups. And um, so they're, that's already, they're in conflict, which is, you know, many versions of that story coming from different backgrounds. So author voice, that can also be confusing when you're just starting out. And even sometimes it can take a little while to understand what that is, but it is the, the tone, I, I believe that it's, it's the tone of your novel. It's really, what, is it playful? Is it somber? Is it mysterious? There, there's a novel that actually won um, the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. He was, the, the writer was interviewed on 60 Minutes uh, recently. And I tried to read his, I think he may have actually the only person who's been two Pulitzer Prize. I'm not sure, but anyway, but I couldn't read his novel. It was, it was all foreshadowing to me of something really horrible. Uh, so I don't have a really high tolerance for reading depressing books, actually. And some people do. I think Oprah has a tremendous tolerance and love of that. A, a lot of the books that she picked in the beginning all were so sad that I like really not were, I don't like to live with those books. But anyway, but the tone, so his tones are very, they're somber, no matter what, something horrible is going to happen to some sweet, innocent person. I didn't want to live with that book for a couple of weeks or however long it took me to read it. But, it, but I picked up on his tone immediately. So if you write murder mysteries, you're gonna have a certain tone. You may start with an explosion, who knows? So, but are you friendly? Is it somber? Is it perky? Is it mysterious? I had an editor at a publishing company tell me once, um, maybe you might wanna write Regency. We don't really have um, very many women of color writing Regency. I hear something in your tone that I, I think that might be good or historical. Well, actually historical didn't appeal to me, even though with some of my educational background, I've read a lot of um, his sort of uh, literature written from different time periods. However, that did not appeal to me. So you have to look at not only what appeals to you, but, and then I had to study contemporary more. So I studied the voice of contemporary authors so that I was in alignment with the expectation what a contemporary author would sound like. I know, it's a lot. So uh, the, <laughs> the very deep, dark moment. So this is like, look at her. Doesn't she look like, oh my God, what's happening to me? Anyway, that was my interpretation of that picture. So um, emotion driven, something dangerous or catastrophic. So it might be in, in, in Orange Blossoms, my novel, because you might be thinking with romance, how is she doing any of this? But it's, she could lose her family's legacy, which is their, their orange groves that they've had for years, for 25 years as part of her family's legacy. And uh, so she would feel horrible about that. But it, so it feels just really awful. It, and it has to look really bad. It has to get really bleak. In these action films or action novels, the person may actually look like, the hero may look like he's dead. He, he, may, he may be on the ground, blood is pouring out of his, you know, just gushing out of his body. He's barely breathing. But, so you have to have a very deep, dark moment. Up, and believe it or not, approximately 75% of the way through the novel is when it has to get dark. I was very surprised to hear the more I learned about specific, some people go in very detailed, um, they provide detailed information in terms of story structure when what should happen, this is part of story beats, first 25%, second 25%, 50% mark, but usually approximately 75% of the way through the novel when all looks lost, um, there's, there, there is this very deep dark moment prior to the resolution. The resolution is when all loose ends are tied up, all the questions have been answered. If you have um, 
four main characters. It's, it's one of those kinds of stories that all of their loose ends must be tied up. The transformation is complete. The person feels like they're, they know the direction they want their life to go into now. They have come to terms with their strengths and their weaknesses. They've improved in some area. So it's external and internal transformation. Sometimes the journey is actually a literal journey where they go from one city to another city or another galaxy. Um, wisdom has been gained and the ending usually indicates there's a new beginning. Uh, rather, it's a new beginning because she saved her children from the clutches of the evil warlord. And now she'll have a new life as a parent taking care of them. And so it's believed that the ending will determine if the reader will buy your next book. The hook will determine if they will read the book that you have written. But depending on how you end it, I read a friend's book. I could not believe her ending. I was so disappointed because there was no ending. I thought, is this a series? Uh, did anybody know that before? Like, you're just leaving this here? I don't even, what happened? Who is that guy? You never explained who the, the creepy guy was sort of terrorizing the kids throughout the novel? Very disappointed. But anyway, but you want the reader to not be disappointed. And, and actually she has not written any sequel. But anyway, all is right with the story world. You want closure. Okay, so I said 10 things. I'm gonna just add a couple of, I call them my bonus elements. Everybody likes to feel like they have bone. I, I love to feel like I'm getting a little extra for anything, right? So bonus element, embrace the edit. When I initially started writing, uh, which was about a trillion years ago, I'll just say that, uh, right after undergrad, I would submit on that, so this is my age on a typewriter when you have to send these manuscripts off and send them a big envelope with the self-addressed stamp envelope. Anyway, I get them back and I see these red marks all over it. And I was like, oh my God, I can't be a writer. Oh, this is terrible. And I stopped. I literally just stopped writing. I didn't realize that writing and editing, it's the same thing. It's, it's not, editing is not our enemy. It could feel like it, but it is not our enemy. And so uh, kind of, and the, even when we write it ourselves and have to edit. So just to be aware of that, we need to edit our own work. And it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to edit it sufficiently for it to be as polished as, it would, as we would like it to be before going to a, um, and I, uh, well, before going, if you're attempting to get an agent, or if you're going the traditional route, or even if you are self publishing, those are all viable, fantastic options. You know, uh, you still want to have a really good editor. Uh, someone at my publishing company said, I don't know why you're also eager for your books to be published. Let us take the time to edit them as long as it takes, because once they're out of the world, that's it. And I thought, oh, she's right. Why was, you know, why am I like, mm -hmm. and uh, so take the time to really, since just, you know, I, I wrote, take a bite of humble pie and grow, you know, okay. So um, then the, this is the next, the last thing. Um, I think it's really helpful to read and write consistently. I am not saying it is easy. Um, everybody has the rest of their lives. They, they have, you know, if you have children or significant others or possibly a job that you need to go to to pay your bills. Um, we have other demands on our time, but as writers, we probably all have a love affair with words to some degree. We just love them. They're, they just, we thrive on them, but finding time it just, it just finding time to figure out when you can read and when you can write and find, and, and some people have timers. Some people say, I'm going to write so many pages. Others like to do sprints. Some do so many words per day. All of it counts. It, it doesn't matter. Just whatever you do that works for you. Um, everything counts. So if you write a blog or a book review, but developing the habit of writing. I've been writing more consistently in the morning now. Of course, I'm exercising less. 
the back, something separate. But it feels so good that I'm getting more done and I'm not acting like it's such a chore to get to my writing. And it doesn't just keep, it doesn't haunt me in the daytime that I haven't written today. Because even if it's only one hour, I, I put some words down. And so I'm really happy. Um, and I, I find it's easier to maintain where I'm at in the story if I don't skip like for a week or two. So ride the up, so ride the ups and downs of euphoria and despair, because that's what I think writing feels like a little bit of both sometimes. Take a breather from your work in progress. Um, I also find that very helpful. And a lot of people advocate that. Set it aside because we're too engrossed in it. Literally, it's like in being in another world. And uh, look at it with fresh eyes. And then my really, the last thing I'm actually really sharing is find your, I showed my husband a slideshow yesterday and he goes, you said 10. Now, why do you keep going on? And I said, sorry, but that's, you know, that's kind of how I am. Um, find your tribe. So I think I, I found that even though a part of me really loves, I really love quiet. I come from, I'm the youngest of seven children. So anyway, I love peace and quiet. And um it's always trying to get away from my older siblings. So, but uh, even though I love peace and quiet, writers need community, uh, find your tribe. It's an isolating profession. I kind of mentioned that before. Uh, and it's filled with doubt and uncertainty and sometimes insecurities. Like, was that trash that I just wrote? Or even after it gets accepted, was that a mistake? Uh, or if you're self-published, should I really put that out in the world? Um, what will other people think? I mean, it's a whole, sort of a whole host of different emotions that can that can even go through. So it's nice to have other writers who understand what you're talking about. And when you're talking about characters, like they're real people that you know, or when you tell them that you were crying during a certain scene that they won't look at you, or that when you say, I hear voices in my head, or I see scenes, they won't say, uh-huh, have you talked to anybody about that? So it's nice to network with other authors and with writing organizations and um, I used to submit quite a bit of um, work be, to contests and things, and I never won any of them, but I got great feedback <laughs> prior to being published. I got great feedback, um, and so it's like getting some free feedback from editors and agents. So, um, but anyway, and just submit, and it's, you just need one person that says, I think this is a value. Um, there's someone who worked on a book for 25 years and whose book has been published uh, and received very wide acclaim, and, uh, but he couldn't sell his story for 25 years and now he is really um, being touted as this wonderful talent. But anyway, so, and then you repeat and you just keep doing that. So don't travel the road alone. There are others that understand what you're talking about and you're excited about writing whatever it is you write, whether that's an article and, and there are people that um, understand why you're excited about reading and why you feel like you have to read. You've got to have a book by your side or why, as one of your members said, they're scattered wherever she goes. Me too. And uh, so it's nice to find your community. So anyway, um, that's my pen name. I'm sticking to it. And uh, so you're welcome to subscribe to my website and those are different ways that you can, and if you would like any highlights from this talk uh, presentation, I would be happy to provide them to you. Uh, and those are ways that you can reach me and that's, that's really it. Um, I have no idea if you have any, I'll stop sharing. So I don't know if you have time for a few questions or yeah, I, I think we do. We have a few, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have a few questions um, okay. in the chat. Um, okay. Glenda, um, we'll, we'll catch that after the recording stops. Okay. But um, so um, the first that. one, there are a couple of comments. One is from Diana. She said, what I notice um, different about literary fiction um, is that it seems to take longer to find the hook. Uh, with genre fiction and TV movies, we have gotten spoiled by leaping into the, the action in the first scene. So I guess um, there's there's sort of an implied question in there, which is, you know, how how long will people wait before they find the hook, uh, in your opinion? I think that Diana is completely right. I think that actually you, I think it's 
kind of risky. I, I, with literary fiction, yes, I think that you can take longer. Actually, my novel was initially more literary fiction, and I didn't have a um, a big hook at the beginning. And I had in one of those contests, I submitted it to prior uh, an earlier version of the manuscript, I should say, an earlier version of the. It wasn't a novel yet, but it was an earlier version. Actually, it was a historical version. And someone said, I can't figure out if you're writing uh, liter literary fiction or romance. I don't know what this is. And I realized that I didn't either. I actually was writing more literary. And I was actually reading more literary. And when I tried to get an agent, when they, uh, on the forms, on the application, well, it's really like an application face it but anyway and um, they would say who are your favorite authors and I was saying all literary and I realized that I needed to back it up and as I said um during the presentation I needed to pick so I wasn't reading a tremendous amount of romance to tell you the truth my favorite authors are not romance authors dare I say but I I um I I learned I studied uh the romance genre because the rules were so clear. I felt like literary is trickier. And I could see that it could be a more challenging task potentially. I I, I like the clarity. I was also told that the last writers were really nice people. When I hadn't made up my mind, I was at a book signing and, and someone said, oh, you're an author. And I said, no, I want to be. And they're like, what do you write? And I said, I'm not really sure yet. And she said, well, I'll just tell you that romance authors are really nice and they share a lot of information, which I found to be totally true. But I think to answer your question, yes. I think that literary is, you you have a little more leeway, a little more. But if you think about the girl on the train, I think that started right away that you knew, I think she saw something in the window right away. And it, it hooked you in right away still. But I do think you have a little more leeway. Okay, and then Larry says, um, the example shown about show, don't tell is a good one. Um, it gets into the mind, the emotion, and the bad self-image of the character. But he also has a question, how do writers approach and write about issues within characters in different cultures without sounding hollow, or on the other hand, uh, gratuitous? Okay, so I think that's a really, I think that's such a big question right now. There, there's so much going on with diverse voices. And the thing is, I think that, this will sound kind of like a simple answer, but even though it's a complex question, I think that if we remember our humanity and if we remember that whatever culture you're in, um, you're, you're, you're struggling with the same issues, to be accepted, to be loved, to be valued, to reach your goals. So unless, I mean, if you're, uh, unless culture is a significant part. So for example, the man that I was talking about whose novel has been reading with wide acclaim and who was writing for, had 25 years of rejection, um, he is Vietnamese and his is a Vietnamese story. So his, he knows that culture. And, um, but I think it depends on the kind of story you're telling how significant culture. So for example, in uh, my story, the main characters are African-American, but race does not come up anywhere in the story. It just happens to be who they are, but it's a lot, it's a story of love and, and family and family secrets. Race has, it doesn't have anything to do with anything because every group has their own journey to love and, and family issues and their own, you know. So if culture is a big part, if it's not a culture you know, but it's a significant part of the novel, then maybe you would have to research or study they also have diversity readers now, but the, the tricky part about diversity readers is there is no one group of any culture that represents the whole culture. So if I, you know, uh, I, I have my own unique experience, but I don't represent everybody of the same ethnic group. I don't represent every woman. Uh, I can. I can tell you some cultural things, but there are others. I'll say, really, you know, my mom is from Utah, from Salt Lake City, Utah. So, um, which initially the story was going to evolve around being in Utah a lot as a girl and coming from a Mormon background. So, even if you see someone's ethnicity, you really don't know who they are. 
right? You don't, you're, we you just make up, we, we're, we make up stories anyway. But so I think it's kind of tricky. So if ethnicity comes in, or if you're straight and you're writing about someone who's transgender or gay, I would say um, just be aware of how much you know or don't know or if you need to research. I watched part of Pose on Netflix, um, which is an award-winning series. And uh, we kind of, I have a group that sort of watches different films and they talk about them, different things on Netflix. And I learned so much about the trans community that I never, never knew. I would never write uh, a book probably with a trans character because I don't have enough knowledge and I would probably be, a, a, I might accidentally offend someone, but I didn't know those things about the transgender community, but I would not select to write about that group because I don't have enough uh, knowledge or I don't want to make mistakes. So I, I think there's a follow-up question to that that I'm, I'm <coughs> excuse me, I'm curious about. So um, you're traditionally published and um, you have your unique ex um, perception and experience in the characters that you write about. Right. Um, for let's say somebody um, who is writing a story and would like to introduce diversity into their story mm -hmm. uh, in terms of characters, not necessarily including race in, in um, a treatise on race and race relations in right. the US today, but you know, people who have friends of different background, like we all do. Um, yeah. Would you suggest that they shy away from that or because of those that. issues? Or are they that big an issue or I know this I, is an opinion thing, but okay. I love writing about diverse characters. The story I'm writing right now, the main character is Miguel Montoya. And it's because he was such a lovely character in, um, in <laughs> a world of my most of chocolate swirl. He was a side character. The main character is a biracial woman. Who, the main hero character is biracial, African American, and white. And the and he the the love interest is Miguel Montoya and his family. And anyway, but he is a so I write about diversity, but he's it's it's not um it's not a race story. Right. My, my characters can be any race. I mean the the main it, it absolutely doesn't matter. I grew up reading Daniel Phil. There, you know what? I don't have to look like Danielle Phil to. Oh, we just lost your audio, Dahlia. Oh, did I? There we go. You're back. You're okay. back. So I read Jackie Collins. I read Daniel Phil. I read, uh, you don't have to, Victoria Holt. You don't have to. Um, if, if, I mean, I have a very diverse group of friends and grew up in a very diverse community, which is. That's really like almost an understatement. I also grew up on military bases. But in, in any case, so there's a lot of diversity there. A lot of people who are biracial and multi schools with a lot of diversity. So that's the world that I create. I, I live in Southern California, as you all do. Where I live, that's who I see. Those are my neighbors, that's me. So they're there, they're walking down the street, they're coming over. We're, those are the friends of my characters in the books. They may have their own book later. Uh, because that's who the doctor is. When the father in the book goes to the doctor, that's who the doctor is. His best friend is the Montoya, the, the father of Miguel Montoya, who's gonna have his own story later. The, his, Mr. Montoya's wife has a, 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 not an Airbnb, but a bed and breakfast. So my character is filled with all different kinds of people, but their culture, it is not a, I'm not writing a, um, a book on, it fits in, but it's not a major, you know. Okay. Does yeah. that answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. And I, I think everybody has to answer that question for themselves yeah. and how comfortable they are and know that um, you need to tread lightly when, when attempting that. I mean, I, everybody wants to have diversity in books because that's real life in a lot of cases, but you have to be careful how you, how, right, how you do that. If you think about Virgin River on Netflix, if anyone has yeah. watched that, um, that that series has a lot of, it, it has some diversity in it. It has age diversity. They're not all the same age. It has some older adults who are main characters. It has younger adults, it has someone in high school. It has people in their twenties and thirties. It has um, the woman who's on the run is looks like she's an Asian character. The man who loved her is an African-American man. So there's really, 
it's just woven, but nobody has ever mentioned race anywhere in there. They're just people living their lives. And where they intersect, they intersect. You know what? I think that's a perfect note to leave that, that topic on. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for your input on that. Okay. Um, so let's see, we have some other questions. Um, how do we approach? Okay. Um, do you have ideas about how to provide a satisfying resolution when your plan is to write a series? Well, yes. So if you're, if you're writing a series, then um, what they refer to them as are standalone series. So that person, so the main two characters, if you have two primary characters, they have resolution, their story ends, but there are other people in the story who are interesting and who people may have said, oh my gosh, I wonder, so in Orange Blossom Club Blooms, someone said, what about Morgan, who is the main character's sister? Because she's more feisty and more adventuresome. And so people asked about Morgan, like I bet that would be an interesting story. Or so it's a separate story, but she's related. But lots of times people will use sisters or brothers. So it could be a series of the, um, Someone, there's a, there's a series where it's a family uh, and, but every brother, uh, that's, that's not unusual for people to do that. So my series is, it's three, it's two sisters that know each other and then it's another sister that, that they didn't know about that's gonna be um, in the last part of this series. But yeah, often you use your family, but the story closes, their story closes. But then now you're going on with them. You know, we've seen movies and we've seen television shows like that. It starts out, there's a main character. I think the Jeffersons came from some other television show. And, uh, and then ben, was it Benson came from another show too. But anyway, they just, there's something interesting about a minor character that sparks people's interest. And so you write a story about that other character who no longer is minor in their own book. The Jeffersons and Maud came from All in the Family. Wow, so okay. perfect example. Okay, so um, how do you know if you have an idea or a hook? Okay. Um, well, an idea, so I think even an idea for a story, so an idea is something that you feel could turn into a story. So, which means there has to be a conflict, right? There is no story without conflict. So just having an idea, I have an idea about these two people, what's the idea? So, but a hook is something specific, concrete, and it's how you begin. So an idea is something referring to something bigger that you can build on. I mean, think about how many words a novel is. You've got to have some, you've got some, to have some complexity in there to hold uh, a reader. So, but a hook says, it better be something interesting. Um, which I could, I, I mean, I could definitely go into that, but I, to not, because I know we have a limited amount of time, but it's, um, there's the one story where the kids are, the movie where the kids have to kill each other to survive, they're selected and picked. It opens with that scene. That's a hook. She's in bed. She's going to find out that day who's going to be um, chosen to have to go and fight to the end. That's the beginning. And you're thinking, oh my God, these children, what? Um, but it's immediate. Okay. Um, we, uh, Frank has a question. <clears throat> the resolution is the big challenge for me. How do you bring it all to a satisfying end without rushing it or contriving it unconvincingly? For me, endings are more difficult than openings. Okay. So I think it helps if you think of the ending around the same time you're thinking of the beginning. So when you have a story idea, it's really helpful if you know where you're gonna be going ultimately. You may not know how you're gonna get there because that's the, the meat of the novel, but you, you, so how you flesh it out is different. But when you're thinking of, this is gonna be this woman. So in Orange Blossom, she's about to, they're behind, they're on default for the loan on the property, on the Orange Belt. The, the, um, the drought, that we have in Southern California has negatively impacted their land. They're in default. The, this guy who represents the bank on the loan, he can reclaim their property and she will feel like whatever. I already know that in the end, those two are going to get together and she is not going to leave oil. 
she's not going to lose the property. I know that in the end. I, I mean, I know that in the beginning that that's what the end will be. If you already know that there will be resolution, you're, uh, then you just put the details together. I think that will help you. But if the end is a mystery for you, the, it, it can make the story less cohesive because you're moving towards something. You need to know what you're moving towards. So I need to know that that couple with all their conflicts and as much as she resents him, as much as she assumes that, so we have a class issues there, she assumes that someone who is a banker at a relatively young age would know nothing about working on land and what that means and the connection to it that she feels. And, and so there's all kinds of assumptions and there are different issues, but I know that in the end, um, they will resolve their differences. And after many mishaps and many circumstances, I know that they will find um, a resolution because I already have that in my mind. So know your ending at the beginning. And I think it makes the journey to the end easier. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Debbie says, uh, when you were talking about your tribe, uh, were you talking about tribe like people who read you or tribe um are as those who support you okay well actually not necessarily either i'm really talking about people like you all i'm actually talking about writers i'm talking about other writers um i we are our own breed we are <laughs> we are our own group um there are people that never read if they can help it uh, and there are other people that can't not read. And so that's a reading group, but I, but writers are a member, we are readers too. I'm talking about the group of reading writers, writing readers, right? We're the same thing. So just straight readers aren't, but I'm talking about people who feel compelled to sit down and put something on paper or some people I realize, you know, they dictate it. Like my editor said, she dictates a lot, um, but they're storytellers. And so I'm referencing people who talk about made up characters, who wake up in the middle of the night, who have bookshelves that are filled with books, who uh, love, who are addicted to stories. And so I'm talking about people who understand that, um, that compulsion to create and to craft stories. That's who I'm talking about. Fans, I am so, I, you know, it's not that I have a giant full of fans. My, my two novels were published last year. However, I just love it when someone says <laughs> that they love what I've written, know that they connect with it. I am forever grateful, but my tribe are other writers. But my fans, they are a group of people that don't, they don't write. Particularly, they could be, they could overlap. But they are people that just say, oh, that story, when's your next book coming out? And, uh, you know, that, that's really exciting. But there, that's not the side I'm talking about. Okay. I, I think um, this would be a good place to kind of um, put our the recorded section of this uh, presentation uh, to end that. And then we'll go for the people who are here um, into a private uh, few minutes of private questions that, that are not recorded. Okay. So I want to thank everybody. Please, everybody who wants to stay on and speak to um, Dahlia, stay, stay with us. Um, but for anybody who's watching this recording, thank you. We hope you enjoyed our presentation today um, uh, with Dahlia Dupree on writing 10 steps, which turns into 13 steps, which, um, as Jim said, is a writer's 10. So I thought that was a great comment. Uh, and we hope that you got something out of this, no matter what stage of your writer's journey you're in and that you will join us next month. Um, again, you can join us, you can go to our uh, website if you're interested at southerncalwriters.org or you can find us on Facebook at SCWA. Um, please look for the writer's um, logo and it's not the Southern California uh, Wrestling Association or South Carolina Water Association. Uh, so um, please everybody keep writing, keep smiling and we'll see you next month.